Hello, dear audience. My name is Katrin Feige, and I would like to welcome everybody to the second session of this year's NBIRBIS workshop. So the overarching topic of the session is interactive digital and virtual visualization techniques. And we have four super interesting talks lined up, which are the Digital Earth Viewer, a 4D visualization platform for geoscience data sets and spatial temporal visualization of a deep sea sediment bloom dispersion experiment by Valentin Book and co-authors. And then after that, Shubia Bola is going to present the air quality temporal analyzer, interactive temporal analysis with visual predictive assessments. Then Carsten Rink is going to talk about a virtual geographic environment for the exploration of hydrometeorological extremes. And last but not least, Aiden Slingsby and Pauline Morgades are going to show us how to assess the geographical structure of species richness data with interactive graphics, work which they created together with Justin Moet. And just a small organizational note, um, please post your questions into either the YouTube chat or our Discord channel, uh, the one that belongs to this session, and those questions will then be forwarded to the speaker after their respective talk. And another thing, um, if you want your question to arrive in time, please make sure that you are up to date with the live stream. That means please check if the red time bar underneath the video is all the way up front, because otherwise your questions might come in too late. All right, so uh, let's move to the first presentation, which is, as I already announced, the Digital Earth Viewer by Valentin Buck, Flenning, Stäbler, Everardo, Gonzalez, and Jens Kreinert. We present the Digital Earth Viewer, a 4D visualization platform for geoscience datasets. So here's a short overview of what we are going to talk about today. First of all, we're going to talk about our motivation. What do we even want to achieve? Then we're going to talk about materials and methods. How did we achieve what we achieved? Then there's a live demo where we're going to show you its features. Then we're going to talk about the Mining Impact Showcase, which is just one application where this viewer came in really handy. And then we'll do another live demo of this showcase. Let's start. In a typical marine expedition, you have a whole slew of different sensors. You've got CTD cars, you've got ADCPs, usually you've also got a map of the terrain, maybe there's also an ROV or an AUV driving around, and usually you'd integrate these by having them open in different software packages and referencing them by hand. So we built this wish list of what should go into one application. First of all, of course, there's single sensor time series data, for example, you've got a CTD cast where the CTD sensor is dropped down over time and then salinity and temperature change with depth. You've also got ADCP casts as seen below where you've got different current directions and strength over time. And of course, a whole slew of different sensors. Then you've got source location in 2D, which is really important. You want to know where was this CTD cast? Where did we place this ADCP? Where was the ROF at that time? Then, of course, 2D data over time this can be imagery. This could be the output of a temperature model, which you've pre-calculated. So that's, of course, important. And 3D data, like, for example, the terrain. It's always easier to imagine how something looks below the sea if you've got a 3D model and not just a colored map. And so we integrated all of this into the Digital Earth Viewer, which enables true 4D data exploration. So 3D data in, four, uh, in one dimension of time. Here's a sneak peek at what it does. And you can see we've got three terrain, we've got 2D data, we've got one dimensional point data, and it's all over time. So how did we do this? So we built the whole application using a server client concept, which allows us to use one portable executable as a server, which then does data extraction using different plugins, one for each file format. And we've got a client which basically runs in the browser and uses the WebGL API. The rest is just done by the operating system. And to build this, we use modern technologies such as Rust and Vue.js. So the server consists of the plugins, 
for example, we've implemented plugins for NetCDF, CSV, WMS, and a few others, for example, the specific file formats for the ADCP current sensors. And now when a client requests data, this request gets uh, received by a web server, which then dispatches it to a scheduler. The scheduler knows about which plugins exist and which files to load from configurations files. And the scheduler then dispatches requests to worker processes, which also reference a cache, so we don't actually have to compute anything twice. On the client side, we've of course got our communication with the server, which also gives us a scene configuration, which is just a list of layers with data sources and configurations and additional settings, such as maybe a color map. And these layers describe what data to load. We then pass that into a data selector, which also does some adaption, for example, to increase performance or to uh, do level of detail stuff. For example, if you're really far away from the earth, you don't need to load the data at the maximum resolution. And the data selector loads this from another cache, a client-side cache, which just reduces network traffic. And the data selector then passes this data into our renderer, which has a visualization shader for each type of layer. So for example, for terrain, there's a specific shader and for points, and that makes our display really efficient. So let's get to the live demo. So in this showcase, you can see the globe and data from GloadUp. GloadUp is a project which collects CTD casts from all over the world. The terrain is from the Gapco terrain project and is exaggerated 100 times. And now this visualization wouldn't be much on its own, but we can actually rotate this globe using dragging and clicking. We can zoom in using the mouse wheel. And you can see at the bottom here, we have a time slider, which we can move and then different points show up depending on which time range we've selected. When we zoom in, you can see new terrain tiles get loaded depending on where we are. And all of these small CTD casts, which look like lines from the air, resolve into single points if we tilt. We can also change a few things about this. There's also a gridded version of the GloDub dataset laid on top as sort of a water surface. And for example, what we can do is we can take this GloDub file and say, maybe the points are too small. We want a larger point size. So we just change this. We can also select a different color map, maybe this one. No, that's not a good color map, I think. Not for this purpose. Maybe this one. Yeah, this looks better. We can uh, stop displaying the other map. And as you can see, we've got quite a lot of CTD casts. Now, if we want more information about one of these casts, and I'm making the point slightly larger still, then we can use the inspect tool and just click, for example, this point, and it tells us, okay, there's a temperature of minus 0 0.8 degrees Celsius here, and also where it is and that it's about 2.6 kilometers below the surface. Let's move to a different showcase. In this case, we're interested in sea currents in the North Sea. And we've loaded model data here, which shows weekly aggregates of sea current directions. And our software can now have this vector field display tracers to actually trace out the currents and visually really show how the water is moving. And again, this is fully interactive in 3D. We could also load in new time. But rather than that, say we're interested in air currents and not sea currents. So let's first disable this layer and then add a new layer by going to Vector Tracer Layer, Atmosphere, Era 5, and then selecting the 10 meter wind component. Now this will, of course, clip the terrain. So let's also select a displacement for this layer and maybe a better color map, uh, say Viridus, and also increase the particle size a bit so we can better see where we've actually got movement. And now if we zoom out a bit, you can see it's actually a global model. And maybe the point size is slightly too large, but let's first increase the movement speed so we can better see the global wind currents. 
And then if we move this time slider, it will load new data for this time period. And once it's loaded, it will start displaying it again. Another thing I want to show is the integration of online sources, such as, for example, OpenStreetMap. And as you can see, actually through our level of detail algorithm, we are able to load more detailed tiles and terrain. And while these tiles are loading, so I can show you where our little institute is located. We can also talk about hill shading a bit. Our hill shading is not baked in, but actually computed while rendering. So we can change the direction interactively. This makes it really handy for, for example, terrain exploration when you want to see, okay, where are hills, where are valleys? And just seeing this from shaded data is sometimes a bit difficult, so we added this hill shading as well. And now to our institute, of course located in Kiel, and this will again load for a bit. Here we go. Now for our last showcase, I've just wanted to show you how this program can also work locally. So I've placed these three data files in one directory and also added this initial source.toml file, which just tells them what file type they are and where they are, what file name they have. And I've also placed the executable of the digital earth viewer here. And now if we launch this, we can drag this window across to the correct screen. And we just get this small frame with the digital earth viewer. And we can also make it bigger and inspect the sources we've just added. For example, the icon art one. And this just works from local data. And also, as long as this window is open, we will be able to access these sources, this instance of the digital earth viewer from our local network. So that's the showcases for just the general application. And now we want to show you a different example of visualization uh, during the Mining Impact 2 project. The goal of this project, of course, is to quantify the impact that mining manganese nodules would have on the deep sea ecosystem where these manganese nodules are found. And for this particular experiment, a dredge was dragged all across, back and forth the sea bottom, creating a sediment plume. And it's the formation and the dispersion of the sediment plume that had to be monitored. But first of all, it had to be visualized, which is not a trivial task, because you see, we have a lot of very different data sources that had to be merged together. First of all, we have the in-situ data, like this bathymetric map of the bottom of the sea, taken by an autonomous underwater vehicle. But we also have current sensors and turbidity sensors. The current sensors, so-called ADCPs, that's these ones, are used to measure the velocity of the water. And the turbidity sensors measured turbidity as a proxy for the amount of sediment that was found on the water at any given point. And to add to that, we have model data. On the one hand, we have the plume itself, a sediment particle model. And on the other hand, we have a deposition model. Where did, it, did these sediment particles land? On the bottom of the sea. So let us take a look at how this looks like once it's fed into the digital Earth viewer. So let's take a look at the data. The very first thing you see is, of course, very prominent, the whole bathymetric map. But the thing we're interested in is this area of sensors right here. Let's go over there one by one. Of course, what you see here is the terrain, the AUV bathymetric data, that's the green map you're seeing. But we also have the deposition model, which would be this darker square projected onto the bottom of the ocean. We have the suspended particle model. Those are these orange ones. And you will see them move around back and forth and increase in size and in color and change in color as this experiment goes on. We have the ADCPs, those are these lines. And that's a way of visualizing uh, the currents of the water. That's how far would a particle go if carried by the currents in this amount of time. We have also the four turbidity sensors. Um, those are these green points, and you will see them change 
color over time as this experiment goes on. So let's see that change over time. Let's set this to maybe five minutes per second and see that go. The very first thing you see is of course the virtual dredge going back and forth and this turbidity sensor is changing in value. Of course, first the nearest one to the dredging, that's downstream, and then the second one. And of course, these couple of sensors over here, those are upstream from the experiment, and though those don't see any change in the turbidity, right? Um, what we are not being completely able to see clearly I will deactivate the suspended particles, is the, the position model right here. And we can see it increasing over time, right? And if I activate the model again, once it stops, you will still see how the, the position models, when, once the dredging experiment stops, you can see that the position still increasing for a while, right? So those particles are st st still suspended in the water column and all those will slowly start uh, landing on the surface of the ocean. A very interesting thing to remark over here is that this is a very small scale experiment, right? So, so these distances are just a couple hundred of hundreds of meters, but we are still using the exact same engine that we used before. And actually, if we zoom out all the way, we can see we are still moving in a 3D globe, right? And we can explore any other part of it. But our experiment just so happens to be in a very small scale. Right there. So let's go back to the presentation. So to conclude, the Digital Earth Viewer is an engine for true 4D data contextualization and visualization. It can display parallel heterogeneous data sources. Its client component uh, can be accessed by a web browser of any kind. The server component can be hosted locally or remotely with executables for Windows, Mac, or Linux. I hope you enjoyed this presentations, presentation and if you have any questions, uh, please go on and ask them or just write us an email. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this super interesting talk. Um, and while we wait for questions that can be posted in the YouTube chat or in our Discord chat, um, I already have a question for you. Um, and this is pointing towards um, how easy it is to integrate new data sources into the viewer. Like, for example, I noticed that you are using the output of Icon Art, um, which comes in a sort of complicated e because a heat real grid, so I guess there's a task of sort of reconverting the data to match the other data sources as well. So do you require that the input data is of a certain format already? Or um, can you configure, for example, an interface to regridding tools such as the climate data operators or easy codes or something like that on the server side? So we've got a plugin based infrastructure. So basically, once there is a plugin already developed, you can load it. And for example, for Icon Art, we've already built such a plugin. And also, we can reproject, for example, geometries that are in different map projections than a normal WTS84. Um, but if your data is in a very special format, or maybe just in your local data export, you would need to write your own plugin, which is completely feasible. And currently, we are also working on not only having this Rust API, but also maybe a Python API so people can mm. easier integrate data. So that means one data source requires one plugin? More or less, yes. OK, so that plugin then contains a reader for that data, basically. Yeah, exactly. OK, okay I see. And um, then another question. Um, is there support for ensemble data or does looking at ensemble data even make sense for your application? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, could you specify what exactly you mean by ensemble data? Yeah, so for example, um, for the ICON model. So there is one deterministic model which is just based on the regular observations, mm -hmm. but you can also perturb 
of the simulations that are done, and then you get an entire ensemble of simulations, which sort of um, yeah quantify the uncertainty that there is in the simulation data. Yeah. So, for example, we've got one visualization layer which actually compares two layers that operate on the same surface area. So that might be interesting to use there, or maybe you could mm -hmm. uh, differentiate it over time, like. How did this one model work in this time period? And how did this other model work there? And we're also working on like derivative products, for example, sampling a certain area over time between two models and then plotting them. So mm. that should also be possible. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, and I see we got one question from Carsten Rink who asks, are dealing with issues such as different geographic coordinate systems or different resolutions in any way, or are you assuming all data sets have been adequately pre-processed? So we support about two thirds of the EPSG standard projections already, and we can regrid from scratch there. And different resolutions also get handled because we are using a level of detail algorithm, so we need to regrid anyways. So this was one of the first things we implemented. And we are also investigating whether it would be possible to choose a different regridding method depending on your data set so that we have a library of available options for you. And you can just set whatever fits your data best. All right. Um, another question from myself. Um, you mentioned that single sources time series are also on the wish list for visualization features. So I wonder if a user sort of has the possibility to generate a time series plot, for example, by clicking into the map, or is time only represented by animation or the time slider that you have at the bottom? Yeah, so our map is 3D and we really need to think about visualization metaphors here. Like if we have a 3D world, it gets difficult to also have time as an independent axis in this world because we as humans are used to experiencing the world in 3D. And you can do things in graphs, for example, like plotting a variable where time is one dimension. But if we're already using all three available dimensions, which we can comprehend, then we need this extra time slider. Mm. So there's no so there's no such feature as I have a 2D plot of a variable that is um, in the data set. Um, like a we're, temporal. We're working on this, but this will be independent from the visualization. It will be like, for example, a new window in your visualization. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Cool. So another question from Carsten Ring. Um, how do, long did this take to develop? How many devs, how much time? So we're two uh, master students working on this, so me and Fleming Stäbler. And we've worked basically for one and a half years on this now. And we've also got support from Everado, of course. Um, but he's also working on a lot of different other projects. So yeah, about three people for one and a half years so far. I'd say this is pretty impressive. Thank you. OK, so uh, let's thank the two speakers in that case, actually, again. And we'll move on to the next talk, uh, which is Air Quality Temporal Analyzer Interactive Temporal Analysis with Visual Predictive Assessment by Shubia Boller, Steffen Koch, Thomas Ertel, and Volker Kurs. Welcome to our paper presentation titled Air Quality Temporal Analyzer AQTA, an interactive system for temporal analysis with visual predictive assessments. My name is Shubhi, and let's explore this interface more in detail. In this presentation, I would be explaining the audience all these sections in detail. So let's get started. The main motivation behind this developed interface are visualization of meteorological and pollution data history and context plays an essential role 
in visual mining data mining especially in exploring the large and complex data sets and environmental conditions including the context and historical information in the visualization could improve user understanding of the environmental data set exploration process traditional approaches cannot fully support the visual exploration of future trends in complex multivariate time series data set such as weather and healthcare mainly due to their lack of consideration of intervariable relationships example if pm10 increases then what will be going to happen to the no2 concentration or would it be decreasing or would it be increasing exploring these relationship through what if questions example what if pm10 increases could help the user to better judge the future environmental conditions with these motivation in our mind we thought why not we plan or explore to mix the goodness of machine learning model and visualization to contribute something which would help in analyzing air quality condition in detail visually and also enhance and also enhance with integrating machine learning model to support temporal predictions for future in order to explore these two domain together we kind of started exploring what's happening in the recent literatures and where and how we can merge the goodness of both machine learning and visual analytics to solve a air quality condition problem so these are some of the related research work which we found interesting and listed here for we have explored more literatures but all rest of the papers are listed in our own paper reference after building an understanding of these two domain and also at the same time having an idea which problem we are going to solve with this combination of machine learning models and visual analytics we kind of provide or designed a solution in a form of an interactive interface called aqta air quality temporal analyzer which is a system to support integration of predictive models machine learning models and detailed pattern analysis of air quality data with time visually so this figure is just an architecture overview of how aqta functions and what are the different phases involved in this architecture and how the system and the user respond to this architecture so what makes this aqta unique the following are the contribution of this current work first one interactive temporal visualization of historical present and future data through various charts to support the user in the interpretation of the data that may be useful for further stages of the mining process such as cluster identification important features and pattern detections second predicting the air quality standard for the desired temporal frame dynamically with five designed deep learning models 
thereby highlighting the respective models success and failure for inference data along with supporting the arguments with easy graphical support and suggesting best option of model to choose third one visual preservation of context and historical information in all these user interaction so these contribution together makes aqta interface unique and later in the following slide we would be seeing all these faces and system user side in detail so now about the implementation and data set the temporal air quality data sets that are used and analyzed in this study provide city centers sensors measurement at several location in stuttgart germany the historical data sets were measured at total eight city center location with different measurements like wind speed temperature pressure humidity along with pollution parameters like no no2 o3 and pm10 the temporal information is collected at an interval of 30 minutes aqta is implemented as a web based application using javascript libraries streamlit krias libraries etc so here the shared link it is also shared and the web demo link is also available in our paper so here in this link we have kind of explained aqta in more detail with each and every phase explanation and also a demo video helping user to analyze this interface easily moving on so once we have this idea of how aqta is working let's get started more in detail with each and every phase so this predictive model and visualization is divided into two sides that is the system and the user side the system side consists of historical air quality temporal data set trained machine learning models structures of various graphs and chart and accepts user queries whereas the user side interacts with the system in various ways the user selects inspects and view the states of the parameters with past present and future predictions information the user could also choose among different machine learning models with analyzing the performance of each selected model predicting the air quality condition for future at different user selected time frame is challenging the accuracy of machine learning model play a very important role in order to support accurate air condition nature analysis as accuracy plays a very important role in predicting the nature of such variant data correctly 
the design machine learning model are validated with intense accuracy analysis and other supporting measures in order to provide a robust and interactive background framework at the same time supporting accuracy visualization of this interface to the user interactively while making them compare the result of our models and also the reality in the same frame is the need of this interface some of the used models in this framework are designed and already prove their accuracy standard by getting published by us in some of the journal papers in this analysis to make our background framework more stronger and comprehensive with respect to the prediction of air quality condition we have utilized five machine learning models and their comparative analysis to visualize and assess these predicting result so after we have this understanding of how our interface architecture look like consisting of a system a user the system where we have incorporated all these machine learning models which are kind of performing their best by proving accuracies and user where user can give or query this system with any any kind of parameter or any kind of time frame selected so moving on this workflow of visual analysis first of all represents the original data set which we are having in our database the first phase is the data overview phase which provide user to interact and explore the data on a temporal time frame the second phase is the data prediction model visualization phase where user can select the respective model perform the prediction and after performing the prediction for the considered time frame and for the respective parameter the user can also analyze the result while validating the result with the reality visually in this figure the distance square chart highlights the difference between the actual and predicted result which is coupled with temporal circle mark chart and histogram which highlight the predicted value revealing the success and the failure of the selected model the third phase is implemented as an air quality parameter correlation structure detailed analysis this image is just a screenshot of this web deployment which can be easily accessible with the provided link the this video provides a quick overview of aqta where user can select a time frame after selecting the time frame chooses a model and the respective parameter and the outcome of prediction is visualized with respect to the validation of these obtained results the results can also be saved in a png or any respective format for future reference aqta was used for visual analysis of 
Stuttgart's COVID lockdown air quality situation, that is, in year 2020, to make visual exploration of prediction models, outcome, and reality conditions that occurred during this sudden pandemic. AQTA results were compared with real-world measurements to support analyzer, inference, outcomes, and interaction. The following are the findings of this case studies. And the following are the conclusion and future work of this work. If you find our work interesting, we look forward for your feedback and improvements and happy to connect further. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, again, we're waiting for the questions to come in, which you can still ask via the uh, YouTube chat or the Discord chat. And while we wait, uh, the first question from my side, um, did you aggregate the data of these eight stations in Stuttgart or did you look at the results for each station separately? There is no aggregation. The model is working independently in each of the sensor location. So it's the original data which we are measuring from the sensors. And then um, did you see any spatial differences in terms of correlation? Uh, you mean spatial difference? Yes, because it's mm -hmm. different geolocations. So there is like, spatially they are different, but a lot of like the relationship between different parameters like pollution parameters and the wind parameters or these meteorological parameters is similar because mm -hmm. these locations are not very far. They are like in the city center of Stuttgart. And we also have this fine stop alarm like air pollution uh, condition sometimes in Stuttgart. So it's a quick check to have the reference what we are measuring on a daily basis. I see. Very interesting. Um, and I see that you provide five different models um, for prediction and for finding correlations. And um, you also provide a possibility to compare the results. And for your use case in Stuttgart, uh, did you have a favorite? Like, where would you say this model worked best, for example, based on verification with historical data or anything the like? Like uh, we have also given this independence to the user because here in this model, you uh, in this interface, you can also compare with respect to time frame how your different models are behaving. Mm -hmm. As per my uh, point of view, like this LSTM model and the convolution neural net network model have shown me more promising result in comparison to SVM and uh, random forest. I see. Um, then another question from my side. Um, do you think it would make sense to also integrate other data sources that are related to air quality, for example, air traffic data, so that you can also find some correlations in there? Uh, very nice. And uh, yes, we have this like we have this idea to integrate it and kind of make it like live because right now, we kind of evaluated what we have achieving with these models. And now we have the confidence that they, they can work in a reality. So now you have the data outcome pre-planned for future months or years. So this is the idea behind. I see. So we still don't have any questions yet. So I'll just stare into the camera for 10 seconds. Yeah, Maybe fine. something is stripping in. I already asked all my questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess this is the side effects of having the online uh, <laughs> uh, presentation. Yeah, there's always a little lag, so 
<laughs> I want to give the audience some time. All right, still nothing tripping in. So let's thank our speaker again. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let's move on to the next talk by Carsten Rink, Özkür, Osan Sen, Marco Hannemann, Uta Ködel, Erik Nixdorf, Ute Weber, Ulrike Werbahn, Martin Schrön, Thomas Karlbacher and Olaf Kolditz, which is entitled A Virtual Geographic Environment for the Exploration of Hydrometeorological Extremes. Welcome to our presentation of a virtual geographic environment for the exploration of hydrometeorological extremes. The study we are about to present is based on data gathered within the initiative on modular observation solutions for Earth systems. This initiative is about understanding the impact of short-term weather events on long-term climate trends. To achieve this, researchers in Germany monitor the evolution of weather extremes such as heavy rain events, flooding or droughts and their impact which is often significant for a much larger region. For instance, the flooding of downstream catchment areas from runoff in upstream headwaters or delayed effects such as algal blooms in coastal zones triggered by nutrient pulses from inland sources. To gather data Mobile and modular sensor systems are used to record energy, water, greenhouse gases and nutrient cycles in the atmosphere, on the land surface and in coastal regions. A special focus of the initiative are interactions between environmental compartments and the affected ecosystems. Based on the multitude of measured and simulated data, we have been asked to create a visualization study both to foster discussions between researchers working within the initiative as well as for outreach to an interested public. The region we are focusing on for this visualization study is the catchment of the Müglitz River. This is one of the intensive test sites for the MOSES initiative. The catchment of the Müglitz River is a small river catchment located in southeast Germany near the Czech border. It is a mountainous region with deep valleys and agriculturally used plateaus. It is also the location of the highest daily rainfall ever measured in Germany, at 300 mm precipitation within 24 hours. The Müglitz River has a length of about 50 km and is a tributary to the Elbe. Intense precipitation events here have an impact on the Elbe River, which is the fourth largest river in Europe, and its catchment which is covering roughly half of Germany. To integrate all the observed and simulated data for this region, we have first created the topological surface as a frame of reference for this visualization study. Based on the catchment boundary and streams within this region, we have created a triangle mesh. This mesh consists of roughly 3.2 million elements with an average edge length of 25 meters. Such a fine resolution is necessary to capture all the details of this mountainous region. The elevation of all mesh nodes has been adjusted based on a high-resolution digital terrain model available from the state of Saxony to create the topological surface. For a more realistic look and better orientation for the user, we have also applied a high-resolution aerial image as a texture to this surface. Both catchment boundary and streams have also been mapped onto the surface. Even in Germany, most people won't be aware of the precise location of this small catchment. Therefore, we start the visualization study with an overview of Germany and a detailed look on the catchment of the Elbe River. We then zoom in to our region of interest, first in a map-like overview, then changing to an isometric perspective to make use of the 3D environment of our framework. To ensure all datasets in the study are correctly positioned, 
we use the same geographic projection for all data integrated into the study. Any pre-processing of datasets is done using VTK, either using our own pre-processing framework, the OpenGeosys Data Explorer, or via Paraview. For the presentation of the study, we use a framework based on Unity. We have presented various studies based on this framework in previous years. It allows the import of environmental datasets, the definition of viewpoints and camera paths, and the adjustment of the visibility and opacity of any object in the scene. We can apply textures to surface meshes based either on color lookup tables or images. Vector data, such as the river network mapped onto the surface, can be displayed with a fixed white independent of the distance to the camera by using geometry shaders. Objects in a scene can be linked to additional data, so that upon picking these objects, a 2D window is displayed showing photos, time series data or documents. The application can be built for various setups, including regular PCs, head-mounted displays or cave-like virtual reality environments. As mentioned before, a large range of observation equipment is used to gather data within the catchment. In the scope of the study, we focus on regular data loggers for gathering information on water levels, temperature or soil moisture, but also precipitation data provided by the German Weather Service, and data gathered via measurement devices mounted on mobile equipment, such as cosmic ray data acquired by traversing the catchment with the sensor mounted onto the back of a car, here shown in the upper right image, or electromagnetic induction and gravi gravimetry data gathered by mounting measurement devices onto a sledge pulled by a tractor over a designated area at very slow speed, here shown in the upper left image. For regular data loggers, we simply display differently colored glyphs representing different logger types, mapped onto the topological surface. In this particular case, yellow glyphs refer to temperature and water level loggers, orange glyphs represent gorging stations, and violent glyphs mark the gravimeter network. Picking a station displays time series data measured at that particular site. For cosmic ray neutron sensing, we chose a different approach. Researchers asked us to preserve the temporal component of these measurements, and we display this data using a procedurally growing line topology mesh built at runtime from the original CSV files, using distinct geometry shader batches. Cosmic ray neutron sensing measures the generation of fast neutrons by cosmic rays, their moderations by collisions with hydrogen and backscattering into the atmosphere. CRNS utilizes naturally occurring cosmic ray neutrons as a proxy for soil water content over a large lateral radius of approximately 260 meters. A similar approach is used for displaying the measured and interpolated electromagnetic induction measured at different depths within the soil. Shown here is apparent electric conductivity which is related to numerous soil properties such as texture, bulk density, soil organic carbon and soil moisture. We also included the results of simulations from two numeric models into the study. The spatially distributed hydrological model MHM was used to simulate transient soil moisture. The spatial resolution of this model is 1000 meters, the temporal resolution is 24 hours. The model was calibrated using gorging station data from 2007 to 2020. If you live in Germany, you may know simulation results provided by this particular software, as it is also used to simulate nationwide soil moisture estimates via the UFZ Drought Monitor that has been featured quite frequently in the media in recent months. The second simulation result is from an OpenGeosys steady state groundwater simulation. It is based on an unstructured grid with an average edge length of approximately 400 meters 
and estimates groundwater levels and flow dynamics. For our visualization study, we represent the simulated groundwater head as a warped surface with a classification of groundwater recharge zones mapped onto that surface. When choosing the representation of these datasets, the main focus was avoiding occlusion of one dataset by another, since they should be considered in correlation with other data. Therefore, we chose to display simulation results as displaced surfaces. In particular, we increased the negative offset of the groundwater head result and added a positive offset to the soil moisture simulation, displaying one simulation result below the topological surface and the other above. Our approach for displaying the precipitation data provided by the German Weather Service is different. The original data is available as 2D raster data at one hour intervals with a spatial resolution of 1000 meters. We transformed these 2D rasters into point clouds, where the density and the color of the points represent the amount of precipitation. This choice has been particularly controversial among reviewers here at Eurovis. However, we tried to find an intuitive 3D visualization of reasonably coarse 2D data that does not completely occlude other datasets. We agree that this representation is probably of limited use for analysis of the data, but researchers of the MOSES initiative liked the visual effect and we still believe it is a useful choice for outreach activities. Independent of the choices of representation of particular datasets, the synchronous animation of transient data at different temporal scales was one of the major requirements for this study. For the prototype, we focused on two heavy rain events in June 2019. The visualization of the delayed effect of precipitation on soil moisture was the initial motivation for creating this visualization study for the Müglitz catchment. And it is an intuitive example to show how processes in the atmosphere and in the pedosphere relate to each other. When visualizing a considerably longer time frame, the animation of changes to the groundwater table will also be required. But within this prototype, it was only displayed as a static data set. In conclusion, we presented a virtual geographic environment for hydro-meteorological studies based on the Unity game engine. It integrates observation and simulation data acquired via a wide range of measurement devices and simulation software within one geographical context. The goal is to show how all these different datasets relate to each other and influence each other. The most obvious example for this is the synchronous visualization of precipitation and changes in soil moisture. The main reason for creating such a virtual geographic environment is to foster discussions between researchers from different domains, present results to stakeholders and reach out to an interested public. We hope that such environments illustrate the rationale of doing such complex measurements in the first place and to show how datasets correlate to form a larger picture and thus facilitate the understanding of complex environmental phenomena. Many thanks to all my co-authors who have been the ones who measured and pre-processed all the datasets shown here and who supported the funding of the study in the scope of the MOSES initiative and the project's Digital Earth and Advanced Earth System Modeling Capacity by the Helmholtz Association. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Carsten, for the really nice presentation. And again, we're waiting for questions to come in via our chat features. And until then, um, I have to say, I really like the visualization of the rain dropping down into the catchment. So I agree that expanding the 2D composite data to 3D really gives an impressive visual effect.
But I have to ask this, of course. Um, did you consider using 3D radar sweep data to represent the precipitation? So that would be actual 3D data, even though it might be a little bit more difficult to process. Um, no, we did not actually. I, I wasn't even aware of this of this data set. So um, uh, I guess you saw we have a lot of co-authors on this paper and basically everyone except me and Ozan are um, domain scientists from hydrology and geo uh, geology and so on. So basically they provided all the data sets we integrated. And um, but um, I will definitely get back to you regarding the data set because that sounds really interesting and having real 3D precipitation in there would be really nice. Okay, yeah, uh, sure, you can do that. Be happy to answer your questions concerning that. <laughs> then we have a question here by Valentin Bock. Your visualization looks incredibly green and legible. Could you explain a little how the process of bringing the data into Unity is done and how much scene setup is done afterwards? Um, so as I explained, um, we basically um, transform all the data into VTK in one way or another. So um, our own um, framework developed for in, in our department is a simulation uh, software that also has a visual component. This is called OpenGeosys and the visual component is the data explorer. And this uses VTK. And um, we basically have a similar setup um, than uh, the one presented in the, in the first talk. So for every kind of data set, we have some kind of, um, well, not really a plugin, but similar um, to get the data into the data explorer, which gives us a, a, three tree, th a 3D representation of the um, original data in VTK format. And then we can use, um, depending on the, on the properties of the data, we can use either um, a VTK plugin for, for Unity to get the data in there directly, which is um, useful if you have, um, if the data is not getting too large, um, because then you can uh, basically build a VTK pipeline inside of Unity, which is really nice. If the data is really large, um, which is usually the case for simulation data, um, then we um, basically apply the pipeline in VTK and then export uh, GLTF data um, from Paraview, for instance, um, which then can be read by Unity. So um, that's the way we get all the data into Unity. And there we can apply uh, various um, well, presentation um, tasks like setting viewpoints and camera paths and uh, fading in and out data sets, super elevating them, things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have another question. Um, would it also be possible to detect the risk of flash floods using all of this data? So I saw you have some soil data, you have the precipitation data, and you sort of know how much water is coming down on the surface. And it would be interesting to see also based on the elevation change, which regions would be especially at risk, like especially for events like the extreme thunderstorms that were scattered over Germany last week? Yeah. Or is that completely out of the scope of, of the project? Um, that's a tricky question because originally when we were planning the project, we were going actually precisely for that. Ah. But um, then um, as things progressed uh, with the Corona crisis going on and so on, um, there was a certain uh, drag in getting data and um, meeting the scientists and so on. So um, by now the project is basically finished. So if it's not too much work, I would be willing to, to add additional data like the 3D precipitation data you've mentioned. But um, actually uh, integrating the, the risk of flooding or, or typically flooded areas um, would probably be out of scope uh, for this particular project now. Um, so um, I hope we get around to it um, in the future at some point. So basically the measurement campaigns are still ongoing, but um, the, the work package for our visualization task is over. So maybe um, we get some more uh, time for, for doing this actually. And um, then this would definitely be one of the goals um, that we are going for. Oh, yeah, that would be really interesting to see. Yeah. All right, um, let's thank the speaker again.
All right, let's move on to the last but not least talk of this session by Pauline Morgades, Aidan Slingsby and Justin Mowat, who are going to present Assessing the Geographical Structure of Species Richness Data with Interactive Graphics. Uh, Pauline and I will present our work on assessing the geographical structure of species richness data with interactive graphics. And this is work that was also done with Justin Moat. A species richness is one of many measures of biodiversity. And what we mean by it is the unique number of species found in a given area. The more unique number of species found, the higher the biodiversity. There are websites such as GBIF, which collate fieldwork data from various sources, and this can be used to measure this. So it's a really great resource as we have lots of location, time, species observations, which we can use to measure biodiversity. But there are many problems with this data. Uh, it's very subject to sampling bias. So it's collated from patchwork of surveys done by various people for different purposes. And so some, some areas may be collected more because they're more interesting or they're more accessible. And also species names may have changed or they may be misidentified. So it's not perfect data. Uh, and that's why it's important that we are able to explore the different aspects of the data so we can make informed use of it. One way of looking at whether we have a complete view of species richness is to use a species accumulation curve. Uh, as, we, as we add observations, uh, we are plotting the species richness. And at some point, the curve flattens off because even if we add more observations, we're not finding any more species. So this means that for this area, we need around two and a half thousand observations to have a pretty complete view of the species richness. This is a species accumulation curve from a paper uh, where we have curves for two habitat types. Montan and Alpine. The Alpine curve shows a lower species richness, but it flattens off more than the Montan area. So this indicates that we have a we have a more complete view of the species richness of the Alpine area than the Montan area. However, species accumulation curves don't tell us anything about the spatial structure of the observations. So we think it's useful to be able to explore the spatial heterogeneity, so how the species richness changes over space, and also to consider continuous geography rather than looking at habitat classification uh, categories. So in our work, we are experimenting with uh, using different spatial measures on the x-axis, distance, area, scale, and combining these with interactive visualization. So here's our species accumulation curve. If we change the x-axis to distance and center, then we're accumulating the curve as we move from the center. And in this case, at a uh, distance of around um, 150 is where we get a complete view of species richness. If we add some species richness away from the center, then now you see that with this curve, we, we're changing the, the curve is reflecting the geographical structure of the, of the richness. We can also look at scale. So here we've got a curve where instead of distance, we've got a uh, one kilometer square scale all the way up to the whole grid cell. And what this is doing is it is showing us the variation in species richness at this scale. So at this scale here, we've got a wider range of species richness than at this scale here. So um, for this project, we used a case study um, on the island of New Guinea. So this watch was chosen because it's a biodiversity hotspot. Um, it's however far from being uniformly collected. Um, so as you can see on this map, um, Papua New Guinea on the east um, has been far better collected than um, Western New Guinea. Um, the data we used is species occurrence data um, that is publicly accessible from the GBIF portal. 
the map on the right um, is a density map of the number of different species for each cell, um, which is essentially the species richness. What we can see, however, is that on the left map, which is the number of observations that we have for each cell, what we can see is that the two maps are almost identical. So this shows that um, the species richness is inherently biased by um, how well an area has been collected. Um, so this is why um, species accumulation curve and interaction um, all needed to analyze the species richness of different areas. The two designs that were introduced so the first one is an interactive just dashboard, which is composed of two species accumulation curves and two um, maps. And the second one is a static tile map, um, which fills the map area with um, scale dependent species distribution curves. So the first one is an R based interactive tool. Um, so just to explain shortly um, a little bit more about how the tool works. So you can see the two uh, two species accumulation curves and the two maps. So the top curve is related to the top map and the bottom curve is related to the bottom map. So the data that is plot, plotted on the curve is the data that's contained in the map boundaries. The map is interactive. So as the user zooms in the map, the curve will change. Um, the user can also move around the map and the curve will change. Um, so the map is a way for the user to select the data in an, in an interactive way. The map is also um, very useful for the interpretation of the curve. Um, so which shows on the x-axis the richness and on the y-axis the distance from the, from the center of the map. So the map shows the number of different observations per, per cell. So it's really important to interpret the curve as we'll see with some examples later. Um, because it shows an idea of the, the coverage of the area. Um, and that's really important information. Um, so the two curves and two maps um, allow for, for comparison of two different areas and two different scales. Um, the user can look at the data at the species level, genus level, and or family level. To give you some examples of precise um, use cases, um, that we found using the tool. For example, those two curves look very similar. Map that goes with them, we have to interpret them in, in two very different um, ways. So both curves seem to be quite um, steady um, and they seem to flatten off at the end. However, the top map shows um, a fairly good coverage um, of the area. So this steady flattening curve might suggest that um, it's been fairly well collected and that we don't have any change of habitats and that the, the different species are quite homogeneous in, in this area. However, the bottom one, we can see that the coverage is not as good. And so the fact that the curve is flattening off at the end might just suggest that we don't have enough data um, to analyze that location. So something else that we're that is interesting to, to spot in the species accumulation curves or the, those sudden jumps that you see here, here, and here, for example. So those jumps mean that um, when, we, when we expand the area that we're analyzing, there's one, one moment where we have a lot of new species coming, coming in at the same time on the curve. So this can be the result of different things. Um, and the map helps us um, interpreting the curve. So on the top one, for example, we see that there's area where there's been um, a lot of collections and area that have no collection at all. So those jumps um, suggest that we're going from a very poorly collected area to a very well collected area. And so this heterogeneity in collection is shown by the jumps because we have all of a sudden a lot of new species. Um, whereas on the bottom map, we can see that um, this area seems to have been fairly well collected. It seems quite homogeneous as well. So this would suggest that the jump in the curve 
might come from um, a change of habitats because as we would cross to a different habitat um, the species that are found there can be completely different and so a lot of new species are, are coming in at the same time on the species accumulation curve. Um, there are, are still some limitations to the design so the first limitation is that because we start from the middle um, and we accumulate observations outwards, um, the, the curves are very sensitive to where the middle of the, of the map is, especially where there is a high spatial heterogeneity. So if I move around the map, um, so we can see that little changes on the map make a lot of changes on the curve, especially as we reach, because we were in a fairly collect, fairly well collected area before, but we can see that here the collection is much more heterogeneous and just a little change um, gives a big change on the curve. So the curve is very sensitive to where the map is. The map doesn't take into account the biozones. Um, also, something that we identified is that this tool um, only knows the comparison of two areas. Um, and finally, the map needs to be interpreted in parallel. The curves need to be interpreted in parallel with the map because otherwise we could interpret the curve um, in the wrong way. Now let's move on to design two, tile maps. So what we're going to do here is exhaustively tile the whole map area with species accumulation curves. And we're going to use scale on the x-axis to indicate spatial heterogeneity. So the wider the red the, the bounds on the curve, the more variation in species richness there is at this scale. So at finer scales down here, we have a lot of heterogeneity in richness. And inevitably, as we move to coarser scales, we're always going to get them converging. But this helps us look at the scale dependent heterogeneity within the space. So here we've got um, several curves tiled over space where each curve represents the, the, uh, the map area below it. And here the, the, the y axis is species richness. So those areas with the um, with the largest uh, vertical extent are where there are more species recorded. So here we've scaled all the curves so they're using a local maximum. So we can't see the, um, the absolute amount of species richness, but we can compare the scale structure of them. Um, as before, we have some curves that don't flatten off, and that either means that they are not fully collected, so we don't have a good view of the richness, or it just means there's insufficient data. We get some curves, these J-shaped ones, where at fine scales, we have very low species richness, and it increases as we look at it at coarser scales. And that's probably because at finer scales, we are only reporting one or two species in isolated areas. And as we get to a coarser scale, then these accumulate to, and we also have S-shaped ones where we get different gradients in the curve. And this probably indicates that we're straddling different habitat areas. As part of our further work, we want to investigate all the possible reasons for some of these shapes. And as we zoom in, we get to see more detail of how these areas differ from each other. This addresses some of the limitations of design one. It's less sensitive to what's at the center of the cell. Um, and it also allows systematic comparison across the map. However, it still has limitations. The gridding is sensitive to the modifiable aerial unit problem, so you'll get different curves depending on how you grid the space. And also the gridding is, is not sensitive to biozone habitat areas as well, just like the first design. Um, so during the project, we, um, we did a participant study with four ecologi ecologists from Q. So each participant was asked to carry out a number of tasks. Um, what resulted from, from those participant studies was really interesting for us because we had insights from um, experts in, in this field and, and uh, people that 
would actually use the tool um, for their work. So what they've suggested is that um, other contextual geographic data would be really helpful to interpret the curves. So a map of the habitats, um, as we saw earlier, this helps interpretation in the curve by differentiating, by um, identifying um, chirps on the curves that are due to changes, changes of habitats. Um, the road map would also be useful because it can suggest um, um, better collected areas because they're more accessible. So other information that would be useful is information about the quality of the data um, and also um, the ability to filter on specific families and specific taxa. So that was really helpful suggestions. They also um, gave possible uses um, of these designs. So which was interesting is that um, each four of the of the participants um, had a different area of expertise. So they saw different use cases for the tools. To reflect and conclude on this, um, the two designs and the participant study shows that interactive vis visualization can help explore the geographic structure of species richness data in a continuous space. Um, the participants said that, um, so although they use species accumulation curves, they had not used them before in an interactive way. Um, so some limitations remains in the designs. Um, this was highlighted by the participant studies, but they also highlight, we also um, highlighted ideas for further development. Um, and the participant study suggest, help suggesting possible use cases for, for the tool. Further work on this could include, um, so as we mentioned, incorporating more geographical context as this would help with the interpretation of the curves. Um, it could also involve um, more investigation of, how, of the interpretations of these curves. Um, and further work could also involve um, developing um, different all tools that would make it more accessible to, to anyone. Thank you very much to the two speakers. That was really interesting. Um, so I see we have Pauline here. Hello. Hi. Um, so I saw there was already a question on Discord, but uh, it has been already answered. I'll still, I still would like to copy it here and ask it to you again. Maybe we get some further aspects on this question. And while I wait that this uh, question is copied because the technicians here are going to do that, um, my first question would be, um, what might be the reasons for the spatially hetero heterogeneous sampling frequency? So is that terrain simply inaccessible or uh, what would be the reasons for that? Yeah, very good question. So I guess um, the heterogeneity of the of the data is kind of inherent to this species occurrence data, just because um, if you take our case study, for example, so the island of Mugaini, it's it's quite big and it's quite dense as well. So just we're um, collectors are not are not able to explore all the areas, and certainly not able to explore all the areas uh, in the same fashion. Um, and also there are factors that do influence which areas will be more collected. So for example, if an area is more accessible, it will be more collected than maybe more remote areas. Um, so yeah, this, this is inherent to the data just, just because collection will never be um, homogeneous. Ah, I see, I understand. So now the question is here. Um... Cast link asked, I'm not sure if I understand your curve representation correctly. Wouldn't that representation be misleading if you, for instance, zoom in on a region on the shore where half of the area is covered by water? And wouldn't the curve in that case change drastically if you slightly move the center of your region of interest? Yeah, so very good question. Yeah, this was covered um, in the second part of the video, but so um, that's right. The one of the limitation of the first design is that it's very sensitive to the center of the of the space. So if you move slightly the the selection of the map, the map will the curve will change um, drastically. And so this is why also the curve needs to be interpreted 
um, together with the map because this is crucial information and the curve interpreted on its own could be misleading. Then there's another question. Um, is the tile representation useful for domain experts? It looks difficult to interpret, but that might just be me not being used to that kind of data. Yeah, so we presented the two designs to domain experts and um, they've said the second one was especially useful to um, explore the whole area at the same time and being able to compare. Um, so for example, the whole of New Guinea, uh, whereas the first design is limited to only two, two locations at the same time. So um, I guess it's useful to, to especially to have a bigger picture and yeah, being able to explore all the areas at the same time in a very intuitive way. Um, and one last question uh, from myself. Um, so for your use case, uh, the sample data that you were using in your use case, um, how large is the time span in which the species occurrences were collected? So, I mean, like how much time passed between the timestamp of the first sample and the timestamp of the very last sample? And would that motivate looking into some temporal effects? Yeah, so very good question again, because this was a, a question that we asked ourselves. So we took the data from the GBIF, GBIF portal, which encompasses many different um, data sets. And so the time span was about almost 100 years ago, so very large. Um, and the time span stamp is important in the sense that all the data could be more uncertain than more recent data, because if it's been collected 100 years ago, um, many things could have happened in the meantime, um, but it, it was a choice on our side to just not filter on the time to have as much data as possible um, for the design. But it would be an area for future research to, to look at how we could um, penalize all the data, maybe not um, filter them out, but penalize them in a way to reflect this uncertainty. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking about effects like urbanization. <laughs> which would sort of make the plants or the species yes. like not Absolutely. be that diverse anymore. Yeah, urbanization or species and extinction. So yeah, this would definitely be an area we'd be looking into. Very nice. So let's uh, thank our two speakers again. And actually let's thank all of the session speakers again. Thank you. So this already brings me to the closing section of this workshop for which I myself also prepared some slide. So first of all, I want to thank all of you again for a great workshop. Uh, in particular, thanks to the authors for your submissions. Thanks to the reviewers for your time and effort evaluating the manuscripts. And of course, thanks to our audience for tuning in and engaging in the discussion. So for the closing, I thought it might be interesting to share some workshop stats. Um, for this year's NBVIS, we received a total of 12 submissions, of which we were able to accept nine based on the reviews, which gives us an acceptance rate of 75%. But even more interesting is the distribution of application areas across different geoscientific disciplines. So the question here was, um, which earth system component was addressed by the visualization techniques and systems that were presented in the individual paper. And the distribution is as follows. Um, we had two papers about oce oceanic data, which belongs to the hydrosphere. We had one paper about air pollution, which belongs to the atmosphere. One paper about species distribution, which belongs to the biosphere two papers integrating oceanic and atmospheric data, which were merged into one talk, actually. Then um, two papers about flooding, which combines data from geosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere. And then one paper about ocean biochemistry data, which is located at the intersection between the biosphere and the hydrosphere. 
So you can see we actually had a great coverage of the different Earth system components. Only the cryosphere was missing completely this year. And I am already excited about how this distribution would look like next year. And then lastly, um, I would like to advertise our special section in computers and graphics, which is related to the NVIS workshop. So if you are working on something related to the visualization of environment, environmental data, um, consider submitting your work here. The pro is, if your full paper is accepted, uh, you get to present it at NVIS 2022, if you have not already presented it this year. And the con is, of course, that there is a deadline, but that deadline is only July 30, which is still some time to go. So it's not really a con, of course. And you can find more information if you follow this link down here at the slide. You can either go ahead and train your fingers by typing it into your browser, or you can go ahead and simply scan the QR code right next to it. And with that, um, I would like to close the closing section, which already marks the end of this year's NVIS. Thank you all for joining, and I hope that we will see each other again next year, and who knows, maybe even in person. And now I wish us all a great week at Eurovis 2021. Goodbye. <laughs>